and you should be able to see the screen that says the day of the Lord will come. Okay, we got that one right. So let me go ahead and advance it to the next one. And here's the question. Now, um, we got a smaller group. Uh, you know, we want to be a little bit careful about having too much discussion or comments during this. I have no idea how long this is going to take me. I'm going to try to fit it in and also leave time at the end for some questions and discussion. But I'm going to start off by asking, do you wish the Lord would return soon? Is that yes. something that's on your heart? You know, maybe take a show of hands. Uh, by the way, if you know how to use the chat box, I'll be watching the chat box along the way as well. And so, um, you know, feel free to um, put that up. I'm going to figure out how to get people back in. I'm sorry, I'm still playing with everything. Okay. What happened to my... Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, so... Um, the other question is, do you wonder why he hasn't returned by now? Does that ever cross your mind and say, well, wonder why the Lord is taking uh, so long and um, why, you know, why he hasn't returned? And so um, these are some questions, and maybe we'll get some answers to that tonight. And so uh, let me go ahead and take us to the next screen. There we go. There's a little button that tells me I have to admit somebody. Uh, so we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 3, and here's the first three verses of that. Um, in the ESV version, uh, it has a subtitle, The Day of the Lord Will Come, where I got the title of this, uh, this uh, study tonight. And so Peter's writing, and he's saying, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and the Savior through your apostles. And now he goes into what we'll be looking at tonight. First of all, he says, knowing this, first of all, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And uh, so I was thinking about just that verse to begin with, that scoffers will come in the last days. Now, that term last days is interesting, too, and as you study uh, things related to the return of Christ and the coming of the Lord, you would probably be tempted to say when he uses the term last days, he's really talking about the things like we've been talking about in Revelation, all of those events that are going to happen the way Revelation describes them. But in reality, it would appear in the New Testament that the apostles really viewed last days from all the way from the time of Christ, all the way to the time of his second coming and beyond. And so they see that, what we call maybe the church age, whenever as the church is progressing. And it's been, what, about 2,000 years now that these last days have happened. So um, I want to be a little bit careful not to say, okay, this is just talking about uh, those people who will be alive when the Lord returns. But, but you see this, this scoffing that's going on. And um, in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we have these verses, 3 and 4. It says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off from this. I don't know about you folks, but does that sound like our time? Does it sound like we're living in those times? where people are going to just listen to all kinds of craziness. And, uh, you know, uh, boy, you get on the Internet, and there's all this stuff going on. You can watch things on TV. And, and, and all these different kinds of uh, people call themselves preachers and things. I am so grateful for Pastor Dave and our, our, our church leadership who, who, who hold to the truth of what the Scriptures teach. And we should never tire of getting uh, spiritual truth from the Scriptures. And, uh, but you can, you can think about, as Peter's writing this, the scoffers, uh, kind of like the, uh, maybe the late night television hosts, the comedians that say, oh, those Christians are always talking about the Lord's returning. <clears throat> you know, heck, it's been 2,000 years. And that's what Peter's going to mention next 
in verses 4 to 6, they'll say, where is the promise of his coming for ever since the fathers fell asleep? All things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And it's just like everything's going on. I mean, now the, the people who are worried about the climate, they, they're seeing uh, concern there. But in reality, we're just, we've just been going on for eons and eons of time. And I highlighted this part of verse 4 because this actually is in reference to uh, what we accept today as scientific truth, and that is the process of evolution. And so uh, I put in here, uh, what is uniformitarianism? Boy, that's a word that's a pretty big, long word. Maybe if you're playing Scrabble, you get a lot of points on a word like that. But uniformitarianism is a basis of the evolutionary thinking that uh, ever since from the beginning of time and, and, and matter and energy, and you've got all these these things, everything just kind of continues slowly. It takes eons of time and with these small changes and things. And every once in a while on the earth, there's a cataclysmic change like a volcano or a meteor coming and hitting it from the earth and killing off the dinosaurs or whatever else they're teaching. But this is the predominant um, theory that is uh, going on right now. And um, excuse me a minute, I've got to let some folks in. And, and so um, let me show you a definition here from, um, oh, I better click again here, sorry. This is from the National Geographic website. And they say that the principle of uniformitarianism says that the present is the key to the past. This principle has a profound impact on the science of geology. So later they say this is known as uniformitarianism, the idea that the earth has always changed in uniform ways and the present is the key to the past. The principle of uniformitarianism is essential to understanding earth's history. However, prior to the 1830, uniformitarianism was not the prevailing theory until that time, scientists subscribed to the idea of catastrophicism. I think I said that right, but anyway where there were catastrophic events. And that's exactly what Peter is talking about as we go a little bit further. He's saying that they will deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And if you've ever done a careful study of the book of Genesis, our small group went through Genesis. We went through the creation verses that are found in, in chapter one, and you'll see that it was with water that God created the things that we have in the heavens and the earth. It's a fascinating study, and I commend it to you. You might need to have somebody who's pretty knowledgeable on these things to, to, to guide you and discuss uh, how the water plays a role. But um, one of the things that troubles me very deeply and, uh, and that is that we do not give credit to God in our day and age for the creation of the universe and of this, of this world and even ourselves. And so um, Romans 1, uh, chapter uh, verses 18 to 25, also talk about this, about how uh, people deliberately um, push God out of the picture, as it were, in their thinking. And it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. And so Romans, Paul writes in Romans, is that God intentionally gave us this wonderful universe and the worlds that we live in with all its great diversity and all the creative. I mean, Susan and I enjoy watching a lot of these nature shows and we see all these different kinds of animal life and plant life here on earth. But then as you even contemplate astronomy, and all the amazing things 
that God has put in our universe. And Psalm 19.1 tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And so I believe that we dishonor God immensely as a culture, you know, the Western world does not believe any longer in God's handiwork in the creation. In fact, if you go on to most of our major college campuses today, all the secular universities, and even some who might call themselves Christians, and you stand up in the lecture hall and you say, I believe it was God by his word creating the heavens and the earth. Well, they would laugh you and scorn you to no end. And this is exactly what Peter was talking about there in this chapter three. <clears throat> but let me encourage you that in at perhaps this very moment in heaven, what we saw in Revelation chapter four is the worship of God and how often in scripture when people are worshiping God, they uh, describe the greatness of the creation and the created world. Here we have the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you our Lord and God because to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. And so we see so many times in Scripture the importance that we honor God for the creation that he's given. And I hope as you get opportunities to maybe, maybe right now is kind of hard to do, but get on out to the outdoors. Maybe you go to the seacoast. Maybe you have a trip where you can see some mountains. You should be worshiping God for the wonderful creation that he's given us. But also, returning back to 2 Peter chapter 3, and we get down to verse 6, it was also by these means, and it's referring to the water, that the world then existed, was deluged with water and perished. And so Peter's reminding us that instead of everything continuing as it was forever and ever till eternity passed, no, there was, there was a point in time in, in an history where God created the earth, he created the universe, and he also judged the world that we live in. And of course, we're pretty familiar, hopefully, with the story of Noah, but I just grabbed a, a section out of Genesis chapter 7. It talks about the flood. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Except for, of course, we know, except for Noah, his family, and the animals that the Lord uh, had him take on the ark. And so... Scripture's clear. There's no ambiguity about what happened during this time in Genesis 7. The entire earth was covered with water. And yet science and scientists will totally deny this. They'll suppress the knowledge of this. And the question we would want to ask is, why is it so important to them that they suppress this, even though there's plentiful scientific evidence, by the way, of uh, this flood happening as well as God being the creator of the earth? But they suppress us. And the question is, well, why, do they, why is it so necessary that they do that? Well, of course, if you have a mighty God who has created all things, who sits in heaven, and he's our judge, then we're accountable to him, aren't we? And so God then holds us accountable, and we need to answer to him. And he has every right to tell us how we're to live our lives. And that's what people don't like to hear, do they? Okay, well, let me keep moving on here. I think we're doing pretty well. When we get to 2 Peter uh, 3, 7, um, Peter then goes on to say, by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. This will be kind of the core focus of what we're talking about this evening. That there is a future time 
when the heavens and the earth will be destroyed and they'll be destroyed by means of fire. And we're going to ask the question, why? Why does God want to destroy the heavens and earth with fire? And the other question I want to kind of grapple with tonight is, where will this judgment, this destruction happen in what we're studying in Revelation? What, what will be the timeline? Because uh, as we go, we'll find out that Peter's talking about something that Revelation doesn't specifically call out itself. So let's, uh, let's continue on. And uh, now we're, we're starting back to the question that Peter started us with, and that is, well, why is the Lord delayed? I mean, it's been over 2,000 years or approximately 2,000 years since Jesus rose up into heaven, and he's not returned yet, and the things that the scripture have talked about at least not the things that Revelation's been teaching us. But Peter says, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is such an important section of this passage. We need to understand this well. Now, the first verse there, verse 8, tells us something very important about our Lord that we probably understand, but it helps support this. And, and by the way, what you don't want to do with this is use it like an equation. You know, sometimes we get kind of mathematical and we say, well, one day is a thousand years, therefore... If in some place in scripture it mentions a day, then maybe it really is talking about a thousand years. I don't think you get to do that. And that's not what the purpose of this passage is about. You have to keep it, of course, in context with what Peter's trying to communicate. What I do believe he's saying is it doesn't matter to the Lord how long it's going to take. That's not the critical issue. He's not in a hurry. But he's got something very important he wishes to accomplish. And so whether it takes a day or it takes a thousand years, that's not important. The other thing that we can understand is that God is eternal and he sits above time. Uh, in reality, when we studied the concept of the creation in Genesis, Genesis 1 once is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that term in the beginning represents where I believe time was created itself. Before that point, it was just God and eternity. And so God is not bound by time. He sits above time as from heaven. I think he can, he can, he can do every, anything he wants at any point in time, but that's a whole other discussion debate for another, another time. But he's willing to allow a thousand years to go by if he would to if he wishes to accomplish his purpose. And we're going to find out more about his purpose. The second verse here, verse 9, says the Lord is not so slow to fulfill his promise, as some kind of slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Let's take that verse and let's talk about it a little more in depth. First of all, I want to ask the question, are you glad the Lord did not come back in the previous generation? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm glad he hadn't come back yet. If he came back 100 years ago, guess what? None of us have been, <laughs> been around. We would not know the Lord, and we would not have the uh, immense privilege of looking forward to eternity. So in one sense, I'm very glad he hasn't returned yet. I'm also glad that the Lord is patient. I don't know about you guys, but the Lord is patient with me every day, right? There's stuff that I'm sure I mess up so many times, and, and the Lord is extremely patient. And he was patient enough to draw me to Christ, right? Whatever I did in my life to resist that drawing, at some point, his patience and his perseverance were, were, were worked in my life and his spirit, and I did come to know Christ. So I'm very glad that, in fact, the Lord has been patient now, Galatians 4.4 gives us an interesting verse. You may remember that between the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, 
Malachi prophesies about the coming of Elijah before the coming of Messiah. And so that was what the Jewish people were kind of looking for. Maybe Elijah would come and then the Messiah would come. Well, it was 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Think about those folks waiting year after year. And they went through a lot of hardship, a lot of tough times, different, different countries coming in and ruling over them and treating them harshly. But in Galatians 4, 4, it says, when the fullness of time had come, God set forth his son, born of a woman. When God determined was the right time, the right place in human history, he brought his son into the world. Jesus became the incarnate son. And so just as God um, planned for the coming of his son in his first coming, there's a right time and a right occasion for when he'll return again. We must understand that, that he's got his times and his purposes. Now, in, and we're going to come back to that discussion a little bit in, in a little bit, because there's some more verses in, in, in 2 Peter 3 that I want to first cover, and then we'll come back a little bit more. Uh, in verse 10, it says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then Excuse me, but you cut out. Hey, Mike, you fading in and out. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, it has to be our internet. I'll try to talk a little louder for you guys. I'm really sorry. Our internet may or may not, or my computer may or may not be helping. I apologize for that. Sue's just told me that. Uh, I just hit something and my screen just went really big. The day of the Lord come. Do you hear me now? Yes. Thanks. Oh, good. Yeah, feel free to let me know when you're having trouble like that. Uh, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That's a fact and statement here what does this sound like to you you know the question is what does this sound like and i'll go back up there to that verse and says well the heavens will pass away with a with a roar there'll be just this massive noise the heavenly bodies will be burned there'll be this great fire this burning but they'll be dissolved as well they'll just completely dissolve them and so uh, you know the question is what does this sound like to you and well, it sounds like a nuclear explosion to me. And, of course, in our generation and, and that of our parents, uh, from 1945, we entered the nuclear age, and we, we were able to see the destructive energy from a nuclear bomb. And it, and it amazes me still that they can take a pretty small amount of matter, uranium or uh, plutonium or anything like that, and they, they, if they... If they turn it into a bomb and they detonate it in a certain way, it will cause such a terrible chain reaction that releases enormous amounts of energy and you get an enormous amount of heat, you get an enormous sound and it literally vaporizes anything that's right there in its, its main path. And that's a single uh, atomic explosion uh, from, from an atomic bomb. Let me suggest to you that this may very well be what Peter is making reference to. You can't say dogmatically, but I'm going to suggest that to you. And let me show you another verse uh, in Colossians chapter 1, 16 to 17. It says, for by him, and by him I put in parentheses Christ, you know that that's in the context of what Paul's writing about. All things were created in heaven and earth. There's that reference again giving honor to God for the creation of the heaven and the earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, he's talking about the angelic beings as well. All things are created through him and for him. He's before all things, and I highlight it, in him all things hold together. And it is very likely what that verse is telling us, that it's through Christ's sustaining power in our universe today, that the very atomic structure of atoms are holding together. And so should he release his grip on matter within our universe, you would easily have 
what we had seen in our atomic explosions. Everything just kind of bursting forth at one time in this great blast of heat and energy and this terrible noise and, and everything being dissolved as it were. And so the question would be, why does God do this? Why is this necessary in, in the end times in, the, in the, his, his grand scheme of, of history? Uh, let me hold that thought, and I'm going to be coming to it, I think, here in a bit. I have to remember my own notes. <laughs> uh, 2 Peter 3, 11 to 12 says, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. So um, I think I must have gotten a couple of my slides out of order. So I apologize if I'll need to come back to a previous thought there. What does it mean about hastening the coming of the day of God? I don't know about you, but back up in this previous verse where it says waiting for, I mean, we're, we understand the concept of waiting for, but what does it mean by hastening the coming of the day of God? Uh, what happened here? Oh, let me, yeah, I'm sorry. Let me take us back to verse 9. I think verse 9 gives me, gives us a clue to what that, what that term means, hastening the day of the Lord. It says the Lord's not so low to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish. And so if you think about it, if the Lord has in mind the people that will be saved for all eternity, and there's still people left to be saved, then he's being patient, and these things that we've been talking about in the end times will not yet take place. But if, if they should become saved, and if you think about if that last person finally comes to the Lord, then will that in fact trigger what it is the Lord has in mind. Let me show you a couple other verses that help me kind of buy this theory a little bit better. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus is talking, and he says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So he's also talking about the gospel being taken throughout the whole world. And uh, for those of us who are engaged in missions and the missionary enterprise of our day, we would be able to say, based on uh, the knowledge of those who are doing the studies, that there are still people groups in various parts of the world that have not yet had the gospel brought to them. And so you've got organiz organizations like the Southern Baptist uh, Missions, the International Mission Board. You've got Campus Crusade for Christ or Crew. You've got Wycliffe. You've got so many organizations that are engaged in the Great Commission process of trying to take the gospel to the whole world so that every person will have a chance to hear uh, the good news, the gospel, and as Wycliffe is doing, to have the scriptures available in their language. And so that's, that's what's happening today. Um, in Revelation 5, when Pastor was covering this passage earlier in the study of Revelation, you see a scene in heaven that says, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God and from every tribe and language and people and nation. And so I highlighted again, that last uh, phrase, all the uh, last part of that verse, because it would seem to us that God intends there to be representation from every corner of the earth, from every tribe, language, people, nation. And again, I think we can say uh, without doubt at this point in time, though we're making incredible progress, that yet has not been accomplished. And so I believe that God is holding back his judgment. He's holding back these events of the end times until uh, the gospel can be taken throughout the world and every tribe, nation, language, and so forth 
will have an opportunity for people to hear and probably have somebody represent that group in heaven. And so that's kind of where I come from when we go back to that thought about hastening the coming of the Lord. Now, we, we have to be careful about that. We don't want to get so big-headed to say, you know, God's waiting on us, and we get our job done, he's, he's going to come back again. No, he's the one that's at work in his church to make these things happen. And so we're actually really cooperating with his program. We don't want to make this a man-centered enterprise. This is really a God-centered enterprise. Okay, let me keep going. In verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 13, it says, According to his promise, we're waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, we want to uh, now come back to the question, why does God have to have this great catastrophic event where everything is just burned up in fire and dissolved? Why does God intend to do this? And again, we, we I love to ask the why question. Uh, some, of, some of you are in our, our study at, at church. You probably get a little tired of me asking the why question all the time. And, and, and by the way, we always don't get a you know, clean answer for that. God never guarantees we're going to have a, an answer to our why question. But it's a good opportunity to search the scriptures and to see what they have to say that might kind of fit in. So let's take a look at that. Um, man. I think I've got a slide. Another slide. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure what happened to some other slides I had. So my apologies. You guys are getting this this stuff for the first time. I've done this study before, but I've never put these slides together. So anyway, spoiler alert. Revelation 21, 1 to 4, we want to ask the question of um, where will this event happen in the uh, timeline that Revelation seems to represent? Again, it's a little hard sometimes as we're studying Revelation to get a precise and exact timeline, but since Revelation doesn't really refer to this uh, whole a judgment and and this destruction of the heavens and the earth. Um, we would we would want to look at uh, where we might get some clues. And in Revelation twenty one, it says, "I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband." And so he says here, uh, John says, he's making reference to a new heaven and a new earth, just as Peter was making reference to a new heaven and a new earth. And so we might come to the conclusion that this destruction of the current heaven and the current earth was, um, has to happen before this point in time. And then here, uh, the rest of that, that section says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. He, God will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, crying, or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And so it is God's wonderful intention that we do not live in an eternity where his creation is marred by sin, marred by destruction, but that he destroys that. He's, he's, he's burning up the current creation because of the effects of sin. Uh, Revelation, or, uh, Genesis chapter 3 talks about when, when God cursed Adam, he cursed the ground, and so our world has been cursed as a result. And then Romans also speaks of, and these were some of the verses I was hoping I had in my deck here. Uh, Romans tells us that the whole of creation groans. And, and we believe that all of creation has been affected because of man's fall and man's sin. And so it, it, would, it would make sense that God has to, through his fire, through his judgment, destroy that form of creation 
and then give us a new heavens and a new earth. And once we reach this point in time, there will be no longer any sin, any mourning, any pain, and we will be with God and he will be amongst us for all eternity. So that's the spoiler alert. Sorry, I know pastor's going to get here eventually, but um, since it kind of ties in with what we're talking about in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, I thought I'd have to take you there. So with that in